Good morning, or depending on when you're watching this, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. My name's Ross, and as always told, out of voice of radio. So today, we need to take a little bit of a look at the complete history of the Pokemon trading card game, and we have made it to Emerging Powers. And Emerging Powers is a really, really, really weird set. Because I could make an argument, and please don't stop watching, I need you watching. These videos take so long to make. But I can make an argument that this is a um, not great set. But I could also make an argument, and I will, that this is a set that absolutely changed the face of the Pokemon trading card game for the entire time that it was legal. It was a phenomenal set in terms of impact. But I'm going to be honest with you, this might be a little bit shorter than some of the history videos I do, because this was kind of a weird set in a bunch of ways. Now, it was released in English on August the 31st, 2011, right after Worlds. There is no Japanese equivalent to this set. Essentially, this is a set that we made up with leftover cards from Japan's black and white set and a bunch of promos. And that's where we ended up. Leftovers from Japan's black and white bunch of promos mashed together to make this set, which is one of the reasons it is an uninspiring set generally. Not only that, but it also brings us, for instance, the first two Excadrill. And Excadrill's not alone, even though it's a fairly small set. There were a few Pokemon that actually had multiple copies in this set. Because, for instance, we have the Excadrill that was in black and white in Japan and got saved for this set here. And the Excadrill that came around as a promo. Excadrill specifically was in the Special Kids Toy Promotion over in Japan. Unfortunately, neither of these Excadrill were good. But don't worry, there were plenty of good Excadrill to be had down the line. Now, the one thing this set did do is that it introduced the legendary Pokemon. I suppose that really is the hook of the set. So we got our first Thunderous and Tornadus. And we got our first Terrakian, Verizian, and Cabalion. Yes, that is how you pronounce Verizian. No, I'm not terribly happy about it. One thing people were happy about, however, was the new reverse hollow pattern. People loved the new reverse hollow pattern. This was the first time we'd seen this, and I remember when it was first announced, when it was first revealed, People loved it. It's kind of a weird new style of reverse hollow with just the energy symbols over and over again. And it's just wonderful. Just a beautiful, beautiful way to do it. I know over the years people did sour on this, which is weird to me. But I remember at the time when this was first shown off, people were absolutely all over it. Now, once again, we did get two new full art cards in this set. We got Thunderous and Tornadus, but there's nothing special about them other than the artwork. They are just straight identical reprints of the Thunderous and Tornadus that come in the set properly, but with the fancy full arts, which again made this a pretty bad set for collectors. Because the only special cards, no secret rares, nothing like that. 98 cards, two of which were full arts. And the full arts were just alternate art versions of cards in the set. And if we do what we usually do and take a look at the most expensive cards in the set, it's these two. You maybe pay 20 bucks. Like, these are the two most expensive cards in Emerging Powers, and honestly, I was looking around on eBay and other places doing the prep for this video. I could easily have picked up either of these for about 20 bucks. In a lot of cases, you know, if you don't need absolutely perfect mint, you could pick them up for 10. They are not expensive. If you're trying to collect, I mean, if you want to collect a set, this is not an expensive set to collect, but nor is it a particularly impressive set to collect. Now, what was kind of cool, you could get yourself a free card sampling pack with some commons from the set. These actually started back in black and white. I forgot to mention these last week. You have my apologies. So here's a look at both of them. But this was when they started doing the free card sampling pack that they would give away on the front of magazines and things of that nature. Now, the pre-release promo here was a Gigalith. 
And you also did get a deck box as well. Shout out to Be Open Blog for the picture. Because I'll be honest with you, right? It's not easy to get pictures of these deck boxes. They're just, I don't know. People are not posting pictures of them online very easily. Like I've said before, these deck boxes were notoriously flimsy. If you used them, they broke. But they did look very, very cool. Now, moving over into the theme decks, we're not talking base set here, so we have two of them. We've got ourselves Power Play and Toxic Tricks. Now, Power Play was the Crocodile theme deck. Remember, by this stage, Pokemon had stopped putting booster packs in the theme decks. And you get yourself a Holofoil Crocodile, which is exclusive to the deck. It was a non holo in the set properly which is kind of cool. And you do get yourself a non-holo Crocodile as well. And then you get yourself non-holo rares of Gigalith, Bertic, and Swanner. My apologies, in the previous video, I did put up the wrong versions of Superior and Samurott when talking about the theme decks. It is kind of awkward. I should mention this was the bad Bertic they gave you in this set, so yay, maybe. And then we had Toxic Tricks, which was the Scolipede theme deck, Psychic and Fire type. The Crocodile I didn't mention was Fighting and Water, but you probably got that. And you got yourself a Hollow Scolipede, which was exclusive to the deck. It was a non-hollow rare in the set proper. You then got yourself a non-hollow Scolipede and non-hollow rares of Darmanitan, Simicea, and Gothitel. But once again, it was the bad Gothitel. There was a really good Gothitel. We'll get there in a minute. But this was not the good Gothitel you got in the theme deck. So I'll be honest with you, as far as theme decks go, these were amongst the worst we saw. You're not getting particularly good cards in here. And they're just taking pretty unplayable non-hollow rares and printing them as hollows. Boo, etc. Now, when we get to the best cards, as far as I'm concerned, there are basically two Pokemon and four trainers. And then a few others we can have a quick chat about. But the ones that were good were good, and none were better than Pokemon Catcher. If you weren't playing at the time, it is hard to overstate quite how big an impact Pokemon Catcher had on the Pokemon TCG. You see, many of you are probably playing with Pokemon Catcher nowadays, but nowadays it needs a coin flip. Back in the day, when it was released, Pokemon Catcher did not need a coin flip. It was an item card that let you drag one of your opponent's bench Pokemon into the active. What we are currently playing today as boss's orders, as our one supporter card for the turn, as an item card. But it was actually even more nuts than that, because remember at the time we had Junk Arm. Junk Arm let you discard two cards from your hand and put what would now be called an item card from your discard pile back into your hand. And the nuts thing here is that essentially everybody had eight Pokemon Catcher in their deck. I know that Junk Arm only came in as a Pokemon Catcher after you used your first Pokemon Catcher, but that would usually be pretty early. And basically, when you were playing at the time, the rule was really simple. Your opponent has Gusting. Whereas nowadays, we sit around going, oh, if my opponent's got a boss's orders, I've lost. There was no question back then. The idea that your opponent didn't have a Pokemon Catcher was borderline laughable. It was overwhelmingly likely that they did, and essentially it was a gusting fest. If you wanted to play an evolution deck, you would better bench two basics at the same time, because if you don't, your opponent will Pokemon Catcher and KO the only one you benched. Don't worry about will they. They will, ladies and gentlemen. They will. Damaged Pokemon on the bench would be gusted up and KO'd. And it really changed how the game was played right up until Pokemon Catcher got errated. Because you had to play the game knowing that at all times your opponent had access to gusting. Which is not really how we played the game before or since. It was weird. Now, in terms of Pokemon, there were two that were genuinely relevant, the first of which was Gothitelle, and Gothitelle was good, or super annoying, depending how you look at it. Like I said, there were two in the set, one of them was trash, and one of them was really good. 
The really good one had the ability Magic Room. As long as this Pokemon is your active Pokemon, your opponent can't play any item cards from his or her hand. So it gave you a different option to Vile Plume, and there were two big differences. This had to be active and therefore attack, whereas Vile Plume didn't. But this was one sided item lock. Vile Plume locked you and your opponent, Goffatel only locked your opponent, and that was absolutely huge. The attack wasn't great. Free energy, 30 damage, plus 20 more for each psychic energy attached to this Pokemon. But it didn't really need to be. Because the whole point of the game was you would set up Goffatel and your opponent would be locked out of the game and then you sweep with Goffatel. It was kind of annoying. The other one that saw a whole bunch of play here was Tornadus. Now, Tornadus, for one energy, moved an energy from your bench to this. It wasn't great. But for free energy, it did 80 damage and moved a basic energy from this Pokemon to one of your bench. And the thing is, at the time, we had double colorless energy, which meant that you would essentially have a double colorless and a basic and keep moving the basic. But it also meant that you could just KO all these set up Pokemon. Ones I mentioned before, like Smeargle, that was a staple in every deck. Well, Smeargle's coming in, rocking a not terribly impressive 70 HP. It goes down. The Shaman that everyone was playing to move energy, that would go down. Obviously, the baby Pokemon like Cleffa would go down. And actually, what you would do a lot of the time with Tornadus is really just sit there and run through your opponent's weaker Pokemon, wear away their bigger Pokemon, and transition into something bigger. But Tornado saw a lot of play for a long time just as an early game Pokemon just to take little KOs and soften up bigger Pokemon. Now they are the two good Pokemon from the set. There are a couple of other fringe ones which are worth mentioning. Bear Tick was one we all tried to use for a little bit of a while. Again, there were two Bear Tick. One was trash. This was the other one. For free energy, 50 damage, the defending Pokemon can't attack during your opponent's next turn. So people played this with Vile Bloom, and the theory here was very simple indeed. Your opponent is item locked, so they can't switch or any of that. And you do 50 and stop them attacking. It seemed like a really good idea, but multiple energy, multiple evolution Pokemon, the ability to retreat out of it. It was one of these that looked so good and fun in theory, but never actually ended up being good. An awful lot of people, myself included, really thought it would work, but it never actually did. Thunderous was nowhere near as good as Tornadoes, but it did see a little bit of play here. For one energy, you searched your deck for a lightning energy and attached it to this Pokemon. And then for free energy, you did 80 and discarded an energy. It was like Tornadoes, but whereas Tornadoes preserved energy, Thunderous discarded it. And Tornadoes worked with double colorless energy, whereas Thunderous didn't. And Tornadus could fit into any deck, whereas Thunderous was lightning only. And Thunderous saw play as a little Pokemon in a bunch of lightning decks. I took a deck built around this and a couple of other Pokemon to a little tournament that I had to drive four hours each way to get to once. I wish I'd picked a better deck given how long the drive was. It was a decent card, but it wasn't particularly good. And then we've got Verizian and Terrakion. Now, these weren't phenomenal cards. We did get really good Verizian and Terrakion, but they wouldn't be here till the next set. These were... I mean, the phrase I like to use a lot is aggressively fine. They were both free energy, 100 damage. So if you piled a bunch of energy on them, they were decent single prize attackers. Bearing in mind that a couple of sets EXs would come back that gave away two prizes. And Terrakion was amazing as a counter to Darkrai if you could get the free energy on. Which was a big if. But given how much Darkrai ruled the format, it's fair to say that having a Pokemon for one prize that could KO the two prize Darkrai was pretty big. And then Verizian, there was no real specific Pokemon. Like, Terrakion really was a Darkrai counter. Verizian was more general, but it was just a decent single prize attacker for grass decks. But again, neither of these were phenomenal cards. They just saw a bit of play, and this is a set where we really need to stretch a bit to talk about good cards. 
But I will say, as much as a Pokemon weren't particularly great in the set, we got some good trainers. I've already mentioned Crushing Hammer, but we got Bianca. Bianca was a supporter card that let you draw until you have six cards in your hand. And it saw a bunch of play. If you didn't want to shuffle your hand back into your deck with N, this was nice. If you didn't want to discard your hand with Juniper, this was nice. It was very much a third supporter. And I know we haven't got to N yet, but if we're talking about this format, we do need to mention N here. You know, N was fine. N was good. And Juniper was good. And a lot of decks may do with just those two supporter cards. But when you wanted another one, Bianca worked quite nicely as a third supporter. We did get Max Potion in this set. Now, Max Potion was great. Max Potion let you heal all damage from one of your Pokemon at the cost of discarding all energy from it. If you're playing a single energy attacker, this was great. But I mentioned Kling Clang in the previous video, let you move all your metal energy around the field. So what you would do is move all your energy off. Max Potion, I've got to discard all my energy. Ah, there's no energy to discard. And then you would move all your energy back. So you'd get all the benefits of healing with none of the downsides. Max Potion was great. And we also got Crushing Hammer. And this was the debut, incidentally, of Crushing Hammer. This is where it all started. Flip a coin. If heads discard an energy attached to one of your opponent's Pokemon. It's still legal in the format today. People still hate it today. This is where it started. It's energy removal. Although one thing I do need to mention before we look at the top decks. And by decks, I mean there was literally one. We need to mention... The Pokemon Catcher pull rates. Because back in this era, there weren't that many trainer cards in each particular set. There were exactly seven trainer cards in Emerging Powers. And at the time, you would all but get a playset of every trainer card in every box. Now, you'd be like one off here or there. But generally, because, you know, there's 98 cards in the set total, seven of them were trainer cards, you would expect most of the time to get a playset of all of them in a box. And Pokemon Catcher was two per box. Like, stubbornly two per box. I opened up a couple boxes of this set. Yeah, I had way more money back then. And I pulled two in every box. And everyone I spoke to seemed to pull two in a box. And bearing in mind it was by far the best card in the set. And it really was why people were buying the set. And again, you could very, very easily see this as a bit of a conspiracy theory on my part. And I cannot prove this, but I'm telling you that at the time, everyone I spoke to was telling me they were getting two Pokemon catchers per box. If you were playing at the time, let me know in the comment section if you bought a box and how many Pokemon catchers were in there. Because at the time, it was a pretty big story given the whole, you know, we needed Pokemon catchers. Now, if we look at top decks, really the only one that came out of here was Gothitelle Reuniclus. There were plenty of Pokemon around that made into other decks. I'm lying. It was basically Tornadus, Rising, and Terrakion. But Gothitelle really was the deck. And to be honest with you, this wasn't the best version of Gothitelle that we had. We got a better version later on. But we would play Gothitelle Reuniclus. And the theory here was incredibly simple. We now had Max Potion. Gothitelle was amazing, but we didn't want Gothitelle being KO'd. So what we would do is we would have Goffertel as basically our only attacker. We'd have Goffertel in the active, blocking item cards and attacking. And then when we got close to being KO'd, we would max potion. But we would never max potion Goffertel. We would use Reuniclus to move all the damage from Goffertel onto a large basic Pokemon on our bench. And we would max potion that. Because obviously we need to keep the energy on Goffertel. This wasn't the best version of Gothitelle, but a bunch of people played it at the time. It was one of these decks that really, really needed Tropical Beach because you're a slow deck and you are setting up with multiple Stage 2s. So this was pretty big. And obviously, because you're probably going down a prize or two while you're setting up, Twins became a really nice option here. And between Twins and Tropical Beach, you actually had a... Because Twins, when you're behind on prizes, search for any two cards. You actually did have a pretty consistent deck. 
And if you couldn't one-hit KO Goffertel, you basically would never KO, and you were item-locked. It was super annoying. There were better Goffertel lists that we got in the future, but at the time when Emerging Powers was out, this was really the only new deck that came around from Emerging Powers. And I absolutely hated it. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. We finally kept the history video to about 20 minutes. Emerging Powers was not a powerhouse set by any stretch of the imagination. It was a small mishmash set that Japan never actually got because they got the cards in other places. And it didn't have many good cards in. But if nothing else, it brought us Pokemon Catcher. And that completely transformed the game. Even if the pull rates were suspiciously low. But now I want to hear from you guys, ladies and gentlemen. What were your memories of playing if you were playing at the time? What are your thoughts now if you weren't playing at the time, seeing this for the first time? And if you were buying boxes at the time, please let me know about your pull rates for Pokemon Catcher. Go nuts. Be nice. And then make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel, follow me on Twitter at the Wasi, and Twitch for some live action at twitch.tv. Slash PTCG Radio. If you want to support the channel, get some bonus podcasts and all that good stuff, head on over to patreon.com slash PTCG Radio, where you can do exactly that. But by far the most important thing as always, look after yourselves till next time, would ya? Thank you very much for watching. My name's Ross, and you've been watching PTCG Radio.